So first of all, let me uh, just start by extending my thanks to the organizers. Uh, this is my first time here. Uh, it's been, it's very nice to be here. Uh, I'm looking forward to hopefully nice sunny weather for the next couple of days and some really interesting talks. Um, so this is a talk about compressed sensing and high dimensional approximation. And I, I'm really pleased to be able to give this talk to this audience, to an audience of people who know a lot about compressed sensing. And also because this talk is going to um, consider a rather different set of applications of compressed sensing than sort of many, many of the talks that we've already seen and that we'll see later in this week. So, of course, compressed sensing in many senses has been dominated by applications in imaging and signal processing. Um, but what I'm going to talk about is high dimensional approximation, and this is motivated by applications to problems such as uncertainty quantification or problems coming from uncertainty quantification. Um, but what I'd sort of like to do in this talk is sort of highlight how sort of uh, this, this set of applications raises some sort of novel questions for compressed sensing, for people doing research in fundamental compressed sensing, but also people who work on particular applications and how they might pivot those techniques to, um, to a different set of problems. So before I get started, let me say this is a joint work with a bunch of people. Uh, I have my, a group at SFU, including my students and postdocs who are working, uh, doing a lot of work on this, and then I have a bunch of other collaborators, too many to, to list uh, individually. So um, the outline of this talk is going to be as follows. I'm going to start with a sort of gentle introduction to the problem uh, and the applications. I'm not going to assume very much knowledge uh, uh, to start off with, so hopefully it will be a, a sort of nice, uh, easy way to ease ourselves into the talk. And then the rest of the talk is going to be effectively divided into three topics. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about three very much related but slightly distinct problems in the application of compressed sensing and high dimensional approximation. And for each one, I'm going to uh, sort of hopefully explain firstly how it comes about in this application, but also try and highlight that it's, it, has, uh, uh, it, it resonates with more general concepts in compressed sensing as well. Uh, at the end of each topic, I'm going to try and lay down a, or list some challenges as well, uh, interesting open problems to work on, and I'm hoping that might pique the interest of people in the audience here as well. Okay, so let me, uh, let me make a start. Okay, so as I already mentioned uh, a couple of times, the motivation for this talk comes primarily from the field of uncertainty quantification. Um, so I don't have an uncertainty, a background in uncertainty quantification. Uh, it's a new, or, or was a new area for me. Um, so here's my sort of one slide uh, to motivate things. Um, so uncertainty quantification is all about the simulation of complex physical phenomena. Think climate, fluid flows, stock prices, et cetera, et cetera. These um, simulations always involve uncertainties, say from numerical errors, inaccuracy of the models, inaccuracy of the parameters, et cetera, et cetera. But what we'd like to do is we'd like to make predictions uh, in the presence of these uncertainties and understand maybe something about the accuracy of our predictions. Okay? So if we're modeling the climate, we want to understand, for modeling climate change, we want to understand how temperature is going to change, for instance. So this is a big field. Um, it's, uh, so if the SIAM UQ conference is now the sort of biggest conference of the various SIAM activity groups. Uh, there's a sort of large amount of interest in this at uh, uh, the big uh, applied math meetings uh, in SIAM as well. Okay, so let me, uh, let me sort of list out the very different, various different problems that one might think of uh, in this sort of broad and nebulous uh, field of UQ, but let me focus on one problem that uh, is going to sort of be the background for this talk. This is the problem of forwards propagation. And in some senses, it's the simplest problem that you can think about in this field. So you have an input Y uh, uh, in RD, and this we'll think of as a vector of parameters. Uh, we have a black box F, so just some function, and then we have an output F of Y. Okay, and this is just going to be real valued uh, for the sake of simplicity. So the point is, is that this black box is some, um, some model of a physical process. So here's an example here that I, I like to use. This is what's called the community land model. Um, 
and this models the effect of climate and vegetation. Okay. So, um, so you have uh, typically over 80 or at least 80 input parameters. Uh, I've listed the first 22 of them uh, uh, in this table here, which is taken from this, uh, this paper. Uh, you probably can't read this, but they have various different uh, meanings, different uh, indices as well, um, related to the type of system that you're trying to model. And your output could be one of uh, various different things, but for example, it could be something called the leaf area index, which is a measure of plant canopies, basically just a, the average area of leaves in your, in your forest. Okay. And so the point is, is that this black box has built into it all the sort of physics about, uh, about this system. Um, this has been designed by a bunch of different scientists. Uh, so all the modeling is done in here. Um, we're thinking of this as a black box and we want to understand uh, the relation between the input and the output. Okay, so our goal in forwards propagation is just to understand, as I said, the dependence of the output on the input. In other words, we want to approximate the function f. So it's just a function approximation problem. But of course, it's not an easy approximation problem. There are two challenges, two key challenges. So first of all, the dimension is large. Okay? Complex models have a lot of parameters. Okay? So one of the things that we're going to have to combat throughout the talk is the curse of dimensionality. Okay? Uh, Secondly, sampling uh, our function, so set a value of the parameters and evaluate f of yi, is typically expensive. Okay? Every time we set uh, some value for our parameters, we have to plug this into our black box. This is typically a large computational model. Run, these things are typically run on supercomputers, so that's expensive. Okay. So we have a problem that's in high dimensions. Uh, we have samples that are expensive to com compute. What are we going to do? Well, of course, I don't think I need to tell this audience what we're going to do. We're going to try and identify some low dimensional structure in our function and then figure out a way to exploit it. Okay. And throughout the talk, a theme is going to be how do we avoid uh, any kind of curse of dimensionality. Okay, so. In order to talk about low dimensional structure, I need to say a little bit more about the, the problem or I need to specify the problem a little bit more to say um, some, something, more uh, something more mathematical. So to do this, I'm gonna consider a, a model class of problem. And these are what, called, what are called parametric PDE problems. So by this, I mean that we have a function u that's a function of a spatial variable x, which could also include time, but uh, that's not important, uh, and a vector of parameters y, and it's a solution of a PDE, uh, sorry, this, uh, uh, where L is a differential operator in X that depends, also depends on the parameters y. Okay. So, this is what we think of as, uh, as, our, um, as our physical model. It's modeled by a parametric PDE, or it could be a system of PDEs as well. And so the output of this is a function of uh, u of the spatial variable x uh, and the parameters y. Um, so how do we get a function approximation problem from this? Well, typically we study some linear functional of u okay, with respect to the spatial variable. So this is what's generally called a quantity of interest in this, uh, uh, in this business. Uh, and for example, this could be the spatial mean, so the integral over the x variable of uh, u of x uh, over the x domain. Uh, or it could just be a pointwise value of u, okay? So uh, in the spatial domain. Okay. Um, so that's the sort of general class of problem that we're gonna think about. And the sort of mystery here is um, how the parameters enter into this uh, differential operator. So to make this even more specific, so I can make very precise mathematical statements in the talk, uh, I'm going to consider a minimal example, which is going to be an elliptic diffusion equation. So this is a very simple model for a bunch of physical processes, for example, groundwater flow, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not claiming that this is a suitable physical model for um, serious complex systems, but it is a model that we can mathematically analyze uh, relatively easily. So uh, with this uh, elliptic diffusion equation, so we have our, our usual diffusion operator, 
we have the diffusion coefficients a, okay, and a is a function of x and a function of the parameters, and it's uh, written this way. And the point is the parameters now are coefficients uh, of a, uh, of the expansion of a in some basis psi j or some functions psi j. We're not gonna worry very much about what these functions are. These could be, for example, the Cajun and Love um, uh, basis uh, if we have a random field. Um, we just assume that there will be L infinity functions. They're not gonna be important uh, for, the, for the remainder of the talk. Okay, so we need a few assumptions um, so that we can apply the usual elliptic PDE theory. Uh, so if this, uh, we assume that this is uniformly elliptic uh, in this sense, and then we have uh, our standard PDE theory about uniqueness and existence of solutions, and also uh, continuous dependence on the parameters. Okay, so to skip um, uh, more details about this model, uh, to skip directly to the conclusion, if you look at this simple model problem and you have a linear quantity of interest, so linear functional of your solution U um, with respect to the spatial variable, then that quantity of interest is a smooth function of the parameters. Okay? Uh, what do I mean by smooth? I mean it's holomorphic. Okay. So that's our, that's our model for U. Okay? We're, we, are, we can now work with under the assumption that the function that we're trying to approximate is a smooth function of the parameters, is a holomorphic function. So, um, so with this in mind, we, um, we're now talking about the problem of approximating a function of um, many variables, but we know that function is smooth, it's holomorphic. Okay. So the question is how are we going to do this? And of course, if you think about approximating smooth functions, the first thing that you generally think about is using polynomials. And that's what we're gonna do. So, uh, let me set up some notation now. Um, we're gonna assume for the majority of the talk that our function is defined on the uh, unit uh, hypercube in D dimensions. Um, we could talk about um, R to the D instead, uh, and then we'd be working with, with different polynomials, but I'm gonna talk about compact uh, hypercubes, which of course we could just normalize to be the unit hypercube. And for concreteness, I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna limit myself to talking about uh, uh, orthogonal polynomials with respect to two measures, uh, the two standard measures, so either the uniform measure or the Chebyshev measure, um, which will normalize to be probability measures on D. Okay, so these are given as follows. And then with, each, uh, with either of these measures, we have the corresponding multivariate orthogonal polynomials, so the Legendre and the Chebyshev polynomials respectively. Okay. And these are, um, because the measures are tensor product, these are tensor products of the univariate uh, orthogonal polynomials or the uh, orthonormal polynomials. Uh, so they're defined like this. Okay. Uh, the, the thing, the point I want to mention here, the point I want to make clear is that uh, just this multi-index notation which will crop up uh, at various points throughout the talk. So here we have phi subscript n is the multivariate polynomial where n uh, is a vector n1 through to nd. Okay, and phi n is the tensor product of uh, univariate polynomials with the corresponding indices. Okay, so um, once we have defined these orthonormal bases, we can take any function that's a square integral uh, and write it as an expansion uh, with respect to the basis functions. Uh, and throughout the talk, the coefficients, uh, the coefficients will be denoted by xn. Okay. Uh, where again here, we're summing over a multi-index n. So, if we want to approximate the function, it suffices to approximate the coefficients. Right. All right, so um, the, um, before we talk about how to compute an approximation to f from samples or anything like that, we should first talk about what kind of approximation would we like to compute. So of course in one dimension, if I have a smooth function, I can do very well approximating it by doing a linear approximation, approximating it by a polynomial of degree s corresponding to just the first s coefficients in its expansion. Yep. 
as I go to higher, oh, as I go to two or more dimensions, that becomes an increasingly less good thing to do. Um, and in high dimensions, we really want to be talking about best S term approximation. So this is where the relation to compressed sensing is going to start. So just to remind you, uh, best S term approximation means approximating our function f by its largest S expansion coefficients in absolute value. Okay. Um, I'll denote this uh, when I need it as S f subscript f. Uh, sorry, f subscript S. Yeah. Okay, so I've, I've claimed that this is a sort of reasonable thing to do for smooth functions uh, of many variables. To make that precise, you can make a statement along the following lines. Uh, if your function is holomorphic uh, in suitable uh, Bernstein ellipses, okay, so I'm, I'm not going to go into the details to spell out the details of that precisely, you can show that the L2 error of your best S term approximation uh, is bounded by a constant depending on f and depending on a parameter p, uh, and then an algebraic factor in s, okay, s to the one half minus one over p, where p is uh, between zero and one, and the, um, obviously this will be a, a faster rate, the smaller p is, uh, the minimal size of p permitted will depend on precisely where, how, uh, and the regions in which your function is holomorphic, so, uh, so that's the detail I'm not gonna go into. So, um, the, the key point about this is, uh, well, the, uh, an important point about this is you don't see the dimension anywhere in this bound, okay? uh, apart from potentially in the constant. One thing that that means is that actually formally the dimension could be infinite here. We could have formally a function of infinitely many variables, right? and as long as we had assumptions on, uh, on, on how holomorphic it was, of course they would have to be fairly strong assumptions, but in theory one can do this, uh, you can approximate, you can, the best S term approximation will actually converge to the function. Uh, and of course there's no, there's no sense notion of dimension here because the dimension is infinite. Just uh, to say a uh, couple more things. So first of all, for this elliptic model problem that I uh, introduced briefly uh, to motivate what was going on, uh, this will hold whenever P is such that these, um, these basis functions that you use are uh, LP summable or their L infinity norms are LP summable. Okay. The, um, for those of you who sort of know the compressed sensing literature, uh, this is really just Stechkin's inequality. Okay. So there's nothing massively mysterious here. This just comes from Stechkin's inequality. Uh, so the constant here is, is really the LP quasi-norm of the coefficients. Okay. Um, this is, uh, I should also point out, this is, this is uh, the result of a series of papers that have taken this and extended it in various ways as well. I'm just giving you the brief, brief summa summary here. Okay, so let's uh, check where we're at. We, are, we're we want to approximate smooth high dimensional functions and what we can assume now is that our coefficients are approximately sparse. Okay, we have some our best S term approximation error get, uh, decays at some rate, so that's equivalent to compressibility. So we have approximate sparsity in our polynomial coefficients. Moreover, we don't generally know which of the S coefficients are gonna be the largest. Okay? Um, the, it's in general not going to be possible to say, if I give you a, if I allow you to sample a function, in which directions that function is gonna vary most. Okay? If I knew the, that those directions, then I might know more about where, where my large coefficients were, but in general, I don't, okay? So uh, it's reasonable to think of these coefficients, the largest S coefficients, their locations being unknown a priori. Thirdly, our measurements, which are just sample values of F at some suitably chosen sample points, are expensive to compute, as I already, already mentioned. So the reason I say this is, in, in my opinion at least, these are the three criteria that are uh, uh, for compressed sensing. If you have a problem where uh, you have some coefficients that are approximately sparse, you don't know where they are uh, in your vector of coefficients, and you have measurements that are expensive to compute, then compressed sensing is, is a, an approach to consider. So we can do that here. Um, we can set this up as a, compressed sensing problem and uh, try and recover the coefficients. 
So how do we do this? Well, uh, the first thing we have to do, we can't deal with infinite vectors of coefficients. Of course, uh, we have a countable number of coefficients. We can't obviously deal with that. So we're going to truncate. Uh, and because we're working with multi-indices, uh, there are different ways in which we can truncate. But we're just going to assume that we have some finite index set capital lambda. It's going to be a size capital N throughout the talk. And we're just going to assume that this is, that this re, uh, is a set that's sufficiently big so that uh, we're reasonably confident our largest S coefficients will live in here. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on this point. It turns out that it's, picking lambda is not going to be a big issue uh, as, we, as we go a little bit later in the talk. OK, so that's our finite index set. Uh, we need to draw some sample points. How are we going to do this? Well, we know from this sort of bounded orthonormal systems framework of compressed sensing, a good thing to do is to sample, draw our sample points IID according to the orthogonality measure of our basis. Then we can set up our measurement matrix A. We can set up our samples B, uh, our vector samples B. Uh, and then we can pick our favorite decoder, and for the first part of the talk, at least, this is going to be quadratically constrained basis pursuit. Okay. So we just minimize the L1 norm subject to our fitting our data. OK, so it's, uh, this all seems fairly conventional. And we can prove a recovery guarantee for this as well. And really, uh, you can do this by going to the relevant uh, Theorem, uh, say for instance, is in Simon's book. Um, open that up and take the relevant theorem and just apply it to this case. Um, so, what do you need? Uh, you need the measurement condition. Uh, so, the number of samples m should be bigger than s times by capital theta times by some log factors, where capital theta is essentially the coherence uh, of this problem. Uh, it's the maximum over our indices in lambda of the L infinity norm squared of one of our basis functions. Second condition we need is what I'll call a tail bound. Okay? We need to make sure that the exact vector of coefficients, uh, so the truncated vector of coefficients, is feasible for our, base, uh, for our uh, optimization problem. And that's equivalent to saying that we have this condition here. Okay? Uh, so this is saying the difference between f and its finite, its truncated expansion in our polynomial basis evaluated on the sample points is less than or equal to eta. Okay. Um, or the sum of those squared uh, normalized by one over m okay, is less than or equal to eta squared. If we have these two things, then we can run through this guarantees us a RIP, this guarantees us feasibility, and we can prove a fairly standard looking compressed sensing bound. Okay. So the L2 norm of our approximation that we compute is bounded by the usual best s term approximation error divided by square root s, plus this, well, we have this extra factor here just saying that we, uh, we have coefficients that we're not seeking to approximate. So this is just the norm of the coefficients outside of lambda, okay. uh, plus eta, our, our fitting term. Okay. And this holds with high probability. OK, so this is all fairly standard, um, but there are two problems with this. So the first problem is this factor theta. Okay? So let me just remind you, theta is the maximum of the L infinity norm of a basis function squared. And the problem with this is this factor can be large, can be very large. So um, if you, for, exa for example, take lambda to be the total degree space, okay, so this is the set of multi-indices uh, where the sum of their entries is less than uh, some number n. And if you're in the high dimensional setting where d is greater than or equal to n, then this thing looks like 2 to the n for the Trebuchet polynomials and 3 to the n for Legendre polynomials. Okay, so we have some exponential growth. Okay. Um, so that's not great. Um, this is definitely something that we want to avoid. Okay. Um, so the other thing is this tail bound. Um, let me be clear here, this is a strict one-sided bound. Okay? We need to have exactly this condition. It's not, satisfa uh, it's, it's not sufficient to have a constant times eta here and maybe pick up a constant in the bound here. You need to choose eta to be strictly bigger than what you have on the right-hand side, uh, on the left-hand side. Um, 
And of course, what we have on the left-hand side is unknown. Okay, we don't know the magnitude of this. It depends on the expansion tail, F minus F lambda. This is unknown in practice. Maybe we can bound it in terms of some appropriate norm of F, but again, that's not know, gonna be known either. So, um, this is unknown, and, and really what we're saying is that this is a problem where we have unknown noise. Okay. Uh, we have some uh, noisy measurements, and the L, we, we're requiring the L2 norm of the measurements to be, or the noise to be less than or equal to eta, but we don't know this L2 norm. Okay, okay so the, the next sort of two parts of the talk are gonna be talking about these issues. Uh, so I'm gonna treat them separately, and in each one I'm gonna uh, show how we can sort of overcome this um, by, uh, by doing some slightly different things. Um, before I do, are there any questions? Okay, so, so I wanna talk about this uh, measurement condition first. Uh, so we have this measurement condition here, and essentially this is guaranteeing us a rip. Okay, that's, that's all it's saying. This is sufficient for our measurement matrix to have an RIP. And of course what we know about the RIP is that it guarantees recovery of all S sparse vectors uh, regardless of where the S non-zero coefficients are. Okay, it's invariant of permutations. Um, and, but if you, if you think about the problem uh, with polynomials, uh, if you have coefficients that look like this, okay, um, this is sort of a good set, support set, whereas if you have coefficients that look like this, this is kind of a bad support set because over in this region where the indices are high, these L infinity norms, the basis functions, which enter into this theta, are gonna be large. Okay. So, what's gonna save us? Well. What's gonna save us is structured sparsity. Um, I don't think it will come as a big surprise that polynomial coefficients are not, uh, not just sparse vectors or approximately sparse vectors. They're sparse vectors plus additional structure. So the question is what exactly is the additional structure? Yeah. Or what is a good model for the additional structure? And it turns out that there's a nice model uh, in terms of what are called lower sets. So a set delta of multi-indices is lower if whenever I have a multi-index n in my set, then I also have every multi-index that lives below it in a component-wise sense. So if I have index n here, I have everything in the rectangle below it. Uh, these are also called downward closed or monotone sets as well. So this, uh, this is a set of multi-indices, sorry, n1 and n2 have become j1 and j2 here. This is clearly lower. Take this index here, you've got everything in the square below it. This index set is not lower because if I take this index here, I don't have this index. And this set is also not lower because I've got a hole. Okay. So, um, I claim that polynomial coefficients of smooth functions can be modeled by lower sets. How can I say that slightly more mathematically? Well, um, you can go back to these results about best S term approximation of holomorphic functions, uh, and you can prove a result about quasi best S term approximation using lower sets. So specifically, under the same conditions that gave, you, gave us the S to the 1 half minus 1 over P bound that we had before, we can prove that there's a nested sequence of lower sets of cardinality delta S equals S, such that uh, the error of the approximation F tilde S based on the lower set delta S uh, has the same error bound, S to the 1 half minus 1 over P with a possibly different constant. Okay. And this is work that, um, that uh, I think the first result of this type goes back to 2010 by Cohen, DeBoer, and Schwab uh, and others. So, what we're essentially saying here is we can restrict our universe to thinking about lower sets and we're only going to possibly lose in the constant. So, how do we promote lower set structure? Okay. Well, the first thing to point out is this is just a union of subspace model. Uh, so, uh, it naturally sort of aligns with a lot of compressed sensing work. Um, however, there are a couple of problems here. Um, 
It's not trivial to, and it's not even clear how one would compute a lower a projection onto the uh, onto a set of lower sets of a given cardinality. Uh, enumerating all lower sets of a given cardinality is not easy. Uh, you can't do this by thresholding or something like that. Um, and so it's not clear how you would do some kind of iterative thresholding algorithm. It's not clear how you would do some kind of OMP either, because it's not clear how you would grow a lower set um, in an appropriate way. And even if we could do this, uh, we're not in the regime where we can choose our measurements to be nice random Gaussian measurements. Okay, we're stuck with measurements that are um, random samples of our, uh, of, of, uh, our polynomial basis. Or are we stuck with a measurement matrix that takes that form? So, what can we do? Well, the solution is actually to just relax our model. So lower sets are prohibiting large, uh, arbitrarily high indices. Okay, if I have a lower set of cardinality S, it can't have an index way out here, because then if it has an index out here, it's got to have everything in the rectangle below it, so that's got to be a cardinality at most S. Okay, so I can't go arbitrarily far out. So how do I uh, penalize high indices? Well, the simplest thing to do is to uh, use a weighted L1 norm uh, regularizer. Um, so rather than solving our standard L1 minimization problem, just replace the L1 norm by a weighted L1 norm uh, for suitable, uh, suitable weights. This has several uh, advantages. First of all, it's a nice convex optimization problem. It's easy to solve. It, all the software that can solve standard L1 can generally solve weighted L1 without uh, too, much, uh, too much issue. Um, and secondly, also weights um, can be used, as, uh, as people will know in the audience, they can be used to also exploit uh, further a priori estimates on your coefficients. Okay? The reason I say this is this is not, not infeasible for some of these applications. If you're dealing with a specific um, problem, a uh, specific parametric PDE problem, you can uh, often get some estimate about uh, at least the directions in which you think your large coefficients are going to lie. Okay, so then you can try and promote that by choosing your weights uh, uh, to uh, to mirror that kind of um, uh, prior knowledge. Okay, so now we've decided we're going to do weighted L1 minimization. The first question we have to ask is, what weights are we going to use? Okay. Um, so I first started thinking about this problem a number of years ago, and what I decided to do was to try and prove what, um, what I'm going to call a local recovery guarantee. Yeah. Uh, I think the first uh, people to do this uh, were uh, uh, Jerome Bigot, Claire Boyer, and Pierre Weiss, who are uh, the last two uh, people are in the audience. And the general idea of a local recovery guarantee is to suppose we have a, an exactly sparse vector uh, with a support set delta, the general idea is to try and derive a condition on M that doesn't assume that um, this has any, any particular stru uh, structure necessarily, <clears throat> but just try and prove a, a guarantee on M that involves delta itself. Okay. And you can do this for weighted L1 minimization. And what you can prove is the following bound. So if you have um, an exactly sparse vector, you can get exact recovery provided your number of measurements looks something like this. So you have a few log factors, let's not worry about those. The most important thing here is this term in brackets. So a couple of pieces of terminology here. Uh, these U's are weights uh, UN, which are these L infinity norms of the basis function. So we've already seen these before. Uh, they cropped up in this uh, capital theta. And uh, the, we also, I've also defined the weighted cardinality of a set. Okay, so it's just the sum of the weights corresponding uh, over the indices, the sum of the weights squared over the indices in delta. So, um, what we can now do is we can look at this, uh, look at this term in brackets here and say what's the best choice of weights. Well, generically for any index set, we can't do anything about this term here because this is, um, these weights are completely intrinsic. We have no flexibility to choose these. We can only choose the weights W. So the only thing we can do is try and make this term as uh, small. Uh, and what we fairly quickly see is that a good choice 
or unoptimal in inverted commas, is to choose the WNs equal to the UNs. Okay. Uh, in which case this term here is just equal to this term, so we just have a factor of two. Okay, so we've now chosen our weights, but of course this, is, this recovery guarantee is not really satisfactory on its own because um, it deals with exact sparsity. Okay. Uh, and of course we know our coefficients are not gonna be exactly sparse in this problem. So we need a, um, a recovery guarantee uh, that uh, is stable. And we can do that as well. The way in which we do this is we take generalizations of the RIP uh, and sparsity, um, in, uh, the uh, generalizations to the weighted setting. So these uh, uh, can be found in a paper of Rahul and Ward from 2016. And using these, we can prove uh, the following recovery guarantee. So we now have a um, best S term approximation, but it's slightly different because we're working in a weighted setting. Um, our measurement condition now looks like this. Okay? Uh, and under this measurement condition and with the same Terrell bound that we had before, we can prove uh, this error bound. Okay? So it's a similar looking thing. What's changed here is the, uh, the S term approximation uh, factor. So the key thing uh, to, to focus on this slide is this constant K of S. This is the maximum weighted cardinality of a lower set of size less than or equal to S. Okay. So that sort of makes sense. That's saying how many, um, uh, this, if, that's saying if I choose my weights in the way we just prescribed, that's rough, that's, it makes sense that that's the, the, the amount that, uh, of measurements I should have to pay to guarantee recovery of any lower set. Uh, and indeed, it crops up in our measurement condition linearly as we'd expect. Uh, and then it crops up in uh, here rather than having S, we have K of S now. Okay, well, um, that's our bound. Um, but we obviously want to know how large K of S is. Okay? In particular, we don't want K of S to depend on the dimension, anything like that. And fortunately, it doesn't. Okay, so K of S actually uh, behaves like S to the gamma. Uh, where gamma is about 1.6 for Chebyshev polynomials, or it's two for Legendre polynomials. So what we're doing is by, by solving a weighted L1 minimization problem, in our measurement guarantee, we no longer see any kind of exponential factors or exponentially large factors, and we trade that off for a slightly larger growth with respect to the sparsity. So the immediate question when you look at this is, uh, when you look at the measurement condition, is to say, well, is this sharp? Uh, is it really uh, S to the gamma for, uh, for these two cases? Or have I just not proved a good enough theorem? Well, uh, one way in which you can try and understand this is to look at what happens with the oracle. Okay. So suppose I had some oracle that told me my support set, told me a lower set where my coefficients lift. Uh, in that case, I would not bother with L1 minimization. I would just uh, do a least squares fit. I'd restrict uh, my columns, my matrix A, to the indices in delta and just do a pseudo inverse. So I'll call that the oracle decoder. And then one can ask the question, how many measurements do you need to ensure uh, robustness of the oracle decoder? And you can ask this in a rather general setting as well, but uh, I'm just gonna ask it in the context of the polynomial approximation problem. And what you can prove, and it's uh, uh, not difficult to prove, is the, for the oracle decoder, the measurement condition is again gonna see this factor K of S, uh, times a, a slightly smaller log factor. So what we're saying is weighted L1 minimization for the recovery of lower sets is actually optimal, okay? Optimal up to log factors, uh, in that it agrees with the, uh, the oracle decoder sample complexity, but of course, unlike the Oracle, it requires you to have no knowledge of your support, your true lower support set. Okay, because um, I'm running a little bit slowly, I think I'm gonna skip through my, my examples. Um, so to, to summarize this, this section, um, basically uh, by, by moving to this weighted L1 minimization, we can achieve essentially a quasi-optimal S-term approximation in lower sets. Uh, and uh, our sample complexity is essentially optimal as well. Yeah. Now, of course, there's still some room to improve things here. Uh, our sampling strategy has just been sampling from the orthogonality measure of our basis functions. 
Um, and it is an open problem to change the sampling strategy so as to get something better. So it, uh, the, the challenge is to come up with a sampling strategy for which you only need s times some logarithmic factors rather than s to the gamma. This is actually known for the oracle, okay? uh, but unfortunately the measure depends on the support set. Okay? So that doesn't really work for the context of compressed sensing. Okay, so um, I now want to uh, change, change stack and talk about the second, uh, second topic a little bit. And this is the issue of uh, unknown noise. Okay. So let me just recap the, the issue that I, uh, met, uh, about this that I mentioned a few minutes ago. So remember we're solving our weighted or our quadratically constrained basis pursuit, uh, and our requirement is that our, uh, our noise uh, has L2 norm less than or equal to eta, okay, the standard thing. So this is required for the theory, uh, and in practice, uh, you will see that good tuning of eta is, is necessary, okay? So uh, it's crucial. Um, the other thing to point out is, okay, I've said here that E just contains our tail and the error in our tail, but of course, in practice, uh, there are gonna be other errors as well, say, for example, numerical discretization, noise, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so just think of E now as just some generic noise in our measurements. And of course, I mean, uh, I'm motivating this by the uh, approximating functions, but of course this, this issue crops up in many applications of compressed sensing. We don't know the noise level, we don't know the true noise level. Um, so a lot of what I'm gonna say now is going to be quite general. Okay, so um, people have looked at this problem in the compressed sensing context before. Um, and we also looked at it, my, me and my postdoc, uh, Simone. And the first thing that we proved uh, was to show if you consider a quadratically constrained basis pursuit without weights, just to keep things simple, um, if your matrix A has a rip, okay, the usual rip of order S, then regardless of the magnitude of your noise, uh, you can prove the following. Uh, estimate um, for any minimizer, okay? So this looks like the standard compressed sensing bound in the first two terms. You've got your best S term approximation, you've got eta, and the effect of not knowing the noise level is encapsulated in this third term here. What is this? This is a constant, depending on A, times by the maximum of the L2 norm of the noise minus eta and zero. And of course, this, this kind of makes sense. Uh, as eta increases beyond the noise level, this term here vanishes and we're back in the classical setting. Okay. So what is this constant here? This is what we call the L1 quotient because it was inspired by earlier work on what was called the quotient property. And it has this, um, it's a sort of sub-inf con uh, constant. Okay. Uh, and I'm not, I, I'm not gonna dwell on the definition too much. So of course, um, the question then becomes how large is this constant? Okay, how, what is the penalty that you pay for not knowing the noise level? Okay. Well, uh, if you're in the setting of Gaussian measurements, uh, this is known, it was known prior to our work. Uh, under the usual RIP for Gaussian measurements, this constant is, is uh, bounded, uh, is order one. For subsampled unitary matrices, so if you're doing imaging, this is a pretty common thing that you might consider. Uh, this constant looks like square root m over s. Um, so that's not too bad either, okay? Uh, so it's gonna be at most a couple of log factors. Unfortunately, uh, if you think about, say, general bounded orthonormal systems, this is unknown. Uh, we were rather frustrated that we couldn't prove a general result about this, this constant um, for these kind of measurement matrices. So, uh, we, we, we did this and we published these results in a paper and we were a little bit frustrated because we couldn't uh, bound this constant. And then we thought, well, why not just change the decoder? Okay. Um, why do we need to work with quadratically constrained basis pursuit? Uh, really, the, the issue with that is that we're solving a constrained optimization problem and that's, that's where all the issues stem from. So why not consider an unconstrained problem? And of course, there's an obvious choice. The obvious choice is to consider the lasso. Okay. Uh, or a weighted variant of the lasso. But uh, for reasons that become clear, uh, and I think will be clear to people already, uh, this is not going to achieve what we want it to achieve. Um, 
But then we uh, thought about the weighted, or oh, the square root lasso. Okay, so it's the same as the lasso, but we don't square the uh, data fidelity term. This is, uh, this is something that's sort of reasonably well known in statistics, but we hadn't seen it really being considered too much in compressed sensing. So, um, let me start with an experiment. Uh, so, what I've done here is I've, uh, I'm plotting the error for various different noise levels for these three decoders as I vary the uh, tuning parameter. So, here it's eta uh, for basis pursuit, uh, here it's lambda for lasso and square root lasso. Um, and what you see, so if you take a quadratically constrained basis pursuit, you see this um, very typical uh, sharp uh, trough um, at the noise level. So eta here very closely tracks the level of the noise. You probably can't see this too well here because um, this figure is too small, but there's a very close agreement between eta, the optimal value of eta and the noise level. And of course, that makes sense uh, in, in context of this bound here. That's really what this bound is saying. On the other hand, for the lasso, okay, uh, the optimal value of lambda depends on the noise uh, in, in a way that's uh, reasonably well known. But for the square root lasso, what we see is the optimal value of lambda seems pretty uh, invariant to the level of the noise. Okay. So this seems like a good uh, candidate uh, to use in this setting. Yeah. The question is, can we prove anything about it? And what slightly surprised me was that you can, and you can do this using the usual compressed sensing toolkit um, without too many modifications. Um, so I think, let me, uh, let me skip lasso and let me go straight to a square root lasso. So under exactly the same measurement condition, uh, provided your tuning parameter looks like this, so lambda is bigger than a constant, where well, we know the value of the constant, times um, uh, square root of the uh, K of S, so this sort of generalized sparsity, if you like, we have this error bound, so the first two terms here look like what we have in weighted quadratically constrained basis pursuit, and now we have this third term here, uh, depending on our noise level. Yeah. So if you look at this, then it becomes very clear that the right way to pick lambda is C times the square root of K of S, and this is independent of the noise level. Yeah. Uh, this is in the weighted context for function approximation, but you can, pr you can state this in, in the sort of general compressed sensing setting as well. So, um, the, uh, I don't think I will dwell on this example too much, um, but the point I want to make here is that this is not just a theoretical exercise, this actually works reasonably well. Okay, so the, uh, the weighted square root lasso, if you set it, uh, if you set your tuning parameter according to the theory, so according to this uh, here, then you get nearly optimal performance. Okay? And you actually can't, if you try and do cross-validation to pick the lambda, you don't do very much better. Okay? Whereas uh, with quadratically constrained basis pursuit, um, you, uh, you actually, you, when you cross-validate, you, you significantly improve the performance. Okay, so to summarize this section, um, so this was all about unknown noise, and what we're saying is this weighted square root lasso basically theoretically um, overcomes this. Okay? We don't have this sort of unrealistic condition about knowing how large our, our error is. Um, this is a sort of well-known thing in the statistics community. I haven't seen it done in, in the compressed sensing context before. And just the point I want to stress again is, is that there's actually nothing very specific to polynomial approximation in this. This, uh, this can be applied generally. So one challenge in this setting, uh, I think it's important to point this out, um, this talk has been in some sense, in many senses, about the curse of dimensionality, uh, but it's been the curse of dimensionality in the sample complexity or the measurement condition that we've looked to overcome. We see the, sample, uh, the curse of dimensionality in the computational cost, okay, because we have to form this large matrix based on this index set that we have to search over. Okay. So an open problem is can you, can you find a decoder that requires time that's only polynomial in S? Okay, so similar to our measurement condition uh, that was S to the gamma. We have some empirical work on this with a, with a weighted version of OMP, but, but no proofs for this uh, at this point. Okay, so uh, in the last sort of um, five minutes or so of the talk, I wanna talk about something slightly different. This is very much work in progress. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm sort of hoping that uh, this will sort of pique interest of people in the audience as well. 
So what have we done up to now? We've, up to now, we've been talking about compressed sensing for approximating a function defined on the unit hypercube in D dimensions. Okay. And this is the starting point for, uh, or, or working on the unit hypercube is the starting point for most of what, of the work that has gone on uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this problem and also in the applications as well. However, um, when you deal with real world problems, it's actually often the case that the domain of the function is not a hypercube. Okay? Um, remember that this I started this talk by saying uh, you have this black box, okay, and you feed your parameters into this black box and you get a number at the end, some quantity of interest. And it turns out in a lot, in, in a, uh, if you're working with complex models, you don't really know the domain in advance necessarily. You might just feed some parameters into your black box. And if you feed in parameter values that uh, don't happen to be suitable, you could get an unphysical value for your uh, function uh, as the output. So I talked about this leaf area index. Of course, that should be a non-negative number. If you get a negative number, you know that you've used a set of parameters that don't make sense for your model. Uh, that's one way in which irregular domains can crop up in these uh, UQ applications. There are various other ways as well, which I'm, I'm not going to go into. Suffice to say, there are a lot of problems where this is, this is the case, okay? Whereas almost all the theory works on hypercubes. Okay, so um, if the question then becomes what do people do in practice? Well, uh, if omega is the true domain, omega might not be known in advance. Uh, especially for the, the, uh, if you have to sample your function to know whether or not your, your input made sense. Um, so that's a big issue in practice. Um, but what do people do? Well, they draw their samples from omega, so they might have to do some rejection sampling based on the output. Um, they just use orthogonal polynomials on the, on the hypercube, okay, when you assume that your true domain sits inside the hypercube and just run L1 or weighted L1 minimization and cross fingers that things are gonna work. The problem is, is that there is no theory for this case now. And I'll talk about why, why there isn't really very much theory uh, in a second. Yeah. So, um, so I started thinking about this a few years ago uh, and um, the first thing I thought about was to say, okay, let's try and say something about the Oracle decoder, okay? Uh, and it turns out that even in this case, uh, it's not easy to determine the measurement condition or the sample complexity of the Oracle decoder. So remember, the Oracle decoder is when you know the support set in advance, okay? So, um, so the, what we were able to prove, though, about this um, was that you need a number of measurements that looks like this. Uh, well, you have this slightly weird looking constant J here that depends on your support set and it depends on your domain omega. And what this constant corresponds to is it corresponds to what's called a Nikolsky inequality. Uh, so it says how large is a polynomial uniformly over your domain uh, if its L2 norm is one, essentially. And on the one hand, Nikolsky inequalities are classical things in approximation theory. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, that, that statement only applies to simple domains and uh, standard uh, polynomial index sets, like total degree index sets. Okay? Uh, we, were, it's, we were not able to find, and I don't think it exists, a general estimate for this, this constant when you look at general domains in D dimensions and you look at general lower sets delta. Okay. So we had to go and prove one. Um, we had to put some conditions on our domain in order to do this. Uh, I will skip over this because I'm running a little short on time. What we were able to prove though is that if you had a domain that um, had uh, a, a, a sort of reasonably nice shape, um, these are all examples of this property, then this constant is quadratic in S. Okay. Uh, and this is for sampling from the uniform measure and using Legendre polynomials. Okay. So this quadratic uh, sample complexity here is, is in agreement actually with what happens in the, uh, when you're working on the hypercube as we saw earlier in the talk. So at least for the oracle, you can say for a large class of domains, your sample complexity or your measurement condition is quadratic in, in the sparsity exactly as it would be on a square or on a hypercube. Okay, so unfortunately this only applies to the oracle though. Okay? So what's the barrier towards doing compressed sensing with, 
uh, or to uh, proving a compressed sensing theorem for this type of problem. Okay? Well, the barrier is that you're no longer working with an orthonormal basis. Okay? You take an orthonormal basis on D, polynomial basis, you restrict it to a subdomain, that's no longer orthonormal. Uh, in fact, it's no longer a basis, it's a frame. Okay? Uh, of course, orthogonality is really key in most of the existing compressed sensing theory. Um, if we were not too far from orthogonal, it wouldn't be a problem. But the problem is, is actually, this is a very ill-conditioned frame. Uh, if you take, if you truncate the frame and you look at the gram matrix, uh, G of the frame, in fact, this is just the expected value of A star A, then this can be very ill-conditioned. In 1D, it grows exponentially fast uh, in the degree of the polynomials. Yeah. So really what you're saying is you have a truncated frame with very poor frame bounds. Um, so that's an issue. That's going to, that's, uh, it's hard to conceive of how you, how you go about proving something for this. Um, but nevertheless, you can still set up and solve uh, a convex optimization problem. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. Uh, so here's our weighted square lasso. The only thing that's different here is now we're only taking samples from omega. So A has a slightly different form. But of course, that changes things. Uh, now, uh, now we're in the context of synthesis, right? Uh, we're looking for a sparse vector of coefficients that fits our data. And the other thing I wanted to stress here, so we, we, we hear a lot about analysis, and I think we will later in the week as well. The analysis problem makes no sense in this context. Uh, you don't have analysis sparsity uh, in this context. Okay, so we're solving the synthesis problem, and I want to just conclude by pointing out that this does work. Um, and it often works pretty nicely. So here's an irregular domain. It uh, looks very much like an annulus. So it's actually the set where this function is non-negative. Um, 1,500 points. Uh, here's our error, our pointwise error in approximating our function. Uh, the L2 error is about 10 to the negative three. And this is, even, uh, this is all in the presence of working with a system of functions that is extremely ill-conditioned. Okay, it's so ill-conditioned I can't even compute the condition number. Um, but I can compute a lower bound that's at least 10 to the 16. Okay, okay this is in 2D. Uh, this is a reasonably nice domain. You can do funky domains as well. So here's a Mandelbrot set in 2D. Again, you get a similar error, and again, you have the similar conditioning problem. Okay. So this is, uh, as I said, work in progress. Uh, the good news is that uh, in practice, this does seem to work quite nicely. Um, uh, you can do approximation on irregular domains, and you just take an orthonormal basis on a bounding domain and then do your usual thing. Uh, you can prove that the oracle has the right kind of sample complexity, but um, uh, for certain domains, we can't do it for all domains uh, at the moment. And we can say nothing about the measurement condition for compressed sensing. Uh, the challenge is to say something that doesn't depend on the condition number. Okay. So uh, saying something that depends on the condition number is a uh, uh, is probably not too difficult. Okay, so um, I'm uh, running over, so let me finish. Um, so just to conclude, uh, compressed sensing techniques have proved very useful in, in the last five, five years or so for high dimensional approximation problems uh, in UQ. They're starting to percolate into large scale software packages for UQ. I think this is a fruitful area uh, for people to investigate. Uh, I mentioned sort of three, three problems in this area that I've worked on. I left out a bunch of other problems that have natural uh, synergies with, uh, uh, with a lot of the topics that will be discussed at this meeting. Um, but here's a, just a sort of short list here of some of the other uh, problems that sort of have direct relations to things that people in the audience may well have studied. So with that, uh, let me finish and thank you. Uh, could you comment on how spread are the holomorphic functions? Right now, your theory it seems to be restricted to holomorphic functions, mm -hmm. but for complex systems, I guess that this might be unrealistic. So, so, um, so I, I mentioned this elliptic model problem, uh, and you can you can extend that to a sort of broader class of problems, um, to a substantially broader class of problems, uh, even some nonlinear problems. I'm not claiming that in the climate land model that's the, the black box is a holomorphic function. Um, that seems difficult to do, and it's, 
it's certainly not the case, and certainly there are problems in UQ where uh, you, uh, as I mentioned here, uh, you can have discontinuous functions as well, or sharp changes giving you effectively the same thing. So, um, I, it's, it's a case where we can prove a lot about, um, and there, it does hold for a bunch of example problems beyond what I talked about, but sure, in the real world, uh, all bets are off. So. Thank you. All right, thank you very much.